Let's see. Uh, hi, everyone watching on YouTube. Um, this is the first week of the Per Docs Book Club with the After Day Science Slack channel. If you missed the Deep Flyer um, videos, well, there's a series on YouTube which you could look back at. In this book club each week, we'll be tackling different parts of the Per Packages official documentation. And each week, hopefully, a different person will be leading, leading the meeting. Um, but let me share my screen and make sure that I've rendered my thing. Okay, so all I put together was some of the things for the book club set up. Just move all of this. So um, I'm going to actually make this a little bit thinner. Um, so yeah, we, we've done DeepLyer. Um, these were the two tutorials that, or three that I was thinking of. There's Jenny Bryant's um, tutorials in here. There's Rebecca Barter's. And then there's some stuff from our studio. Um, it's like a section. It's, if you're teaching the tidyverse, it's, set, it's asking when should you start using per. And that's actually something we could maybe look at today as well if we're, if we're short on um, content for the end. But let's just assume that you've already decided you're going to teach per or you're going to learn per. Well, there's this thing um, in programming and it's called, say, functional programming. And if you're familiar with per or if you've seen it before, you will have seen on their documentation that per is to help with functional programming. Um, and taken just straight from the Wikipedia, uh, functional programming is like a paradigm. So it's it's a set of ideas that I guess a set a different set of people have come together and have developed. And essentially in this paradigm, you have functions treated as what are called like first class objects. Um, but really all a function is, is like it's an operating procedure, right? So it takes some inputs and you give it a schema or a structure um, that it forms on those inputs and then it gives out some value. So it's like a mathematical function. Um, if anyone wants to like get a deep dive on the different paradigms. So like when you go onto Wikipedia, I didn't want to do that. You have, you can follow like programming paradigm, right? And you get down to this kind of bucket. So you've got imperative, the imperative paradigm and you've got declarative. And most people, once they've done a bit of programming will be at least familiar with like object oriented programming. Um, if you ever use ggplot, like, ggplot objects behave differently to other things and that's more common in other languages like say java or python um whereas in r which tends to be more despite you know, big examples like ggplot of a functional um programming paradigm and hopefully as we go th this kind of this idea will become more clear in our heads um because i i do think even after you read it a bunch of times it's not immediately obvious like what some of the differences are and where they overlap um but okay there are some like some things i've noticed that i used to hear a lot that until i understood what they meant um i'd always find them a bit of a block like i'd hear the term a higher order function and i wouldn't know what it meant um I'm not going to go through these definitions. They can just stay in, in like the docs, and this can be used as something that we perhaps add to as we get different uh, definitions. But bear in mind, there are a few things here that that will be very helpful. Um, but here's an example of say like, and this is in a different language to R, so this is in JavaScript, but they actually read quite similar. Um, and you can see. At the top, we're doing some iterative programming, um, which is like for all the stuff in here, it's kind of do stuff with it and set some conditions. Every time a condition is met, we'll like do something to the result and, and change it versus achieving kind of the same outcome, but 
through steps of functions, we outline the list, call a function on it, call another function, call another function, and we get to the end. And, and kind of the, the reason for using per is that you can avoid having to do stuff like this, um, and you can do stuff that's more like this. Um, but let's say you want to do, well, one of the things functions are really good for, and sha, I think it's definitely, it is definitely worth, worth us taking a step back after and looking at actual R functions. But like one of the points of functions or one of the functions of functions, right, is to stop you doing the same thing lots of times. Like if you find yourself copying, pasting code from one workflow to another or from one project, or even just like in the same part of the script, like here and changing, changing tiny things. Well, this is a case where you're doing the nearly the same thing lots of times. And say if you had like, I don't know, 500 files in here, you wouldn't want to type out each one down to 500 and change the little bit that you need and then bring them all together. So in R or in other programming languages, like it's very common to be introduced to for loops, like we're saying these iterative things here. Um, and personally, I have, oh, I cut out some text, but personally, I've always found, despite learning Python before R, I have always found for loops in R to just be really like unintuitive. Uh, every time I have to write one, I always like have to sit there and really think um, and get it wrong and then iterate on it, get it back. It it's just it doesn't really fit with the R way where everything's kind of vectorized, right? But this is one way you could do all of this, but in a for loop. So you set out the numbers from one to four because you're going to paste them in to replace these because um, that's the only thing that's changing. And um, you read in each of them and then you use like the assign function, which assign stuff to an environment and you paste in data in the number. So you find from this, like you get this and then you could do this on all of them again. Um, but like there are lots of other things that until you have nice tools like per or the tidyverse, well, you end up, um, I mean, this is actually a silly example because you can just use the names function. But let's say you wanted to print, go over the names and print every single one of them. This gives you like the column names. Um, something a little bit maybe more like realistic is you want the mean for each variable um, in, a, in a data frame. Or well, you can start iterating like this. And one of the nasty things about this is it gets like where this paste is, unless you have the rainbow brackets, it's kind of annoying to you figure out, oh, this is like the paste stuff. And when you're writing this code, it's really easy to make mistakes. And um, that's provided you can even get it to do what you want. Like it's hard to change stuff. It's kind of hard to read. It, it doesn't really like using the bracket and the indexing stuff. Good code kind of reads like English um, and it's easy to understand, right? Um, whereas kind of grim code reads like this. You can get, well, let, let's get down to a really, so you got the unique values um, for each column. You do stuff like this and you print this list. Um, well, you print each one individually and it kind of looks like a list. And again, it's like, it's a bit unintuitive to print two things separately. Um, and this one was, okay, you don't actually use it because um, like there are no NA values, I think, in Mount Cars. But say if you wanted to impute missing values, so like if you've got NAs in your value, you want to calculate the mean for that column and then replace all the NAs um, with the mean. You can do that with for loops. It's just like... I don't know, just, <laughs> you just don't really want to have to. Um, as you start getting stuff like this list coming off of this list, and then like, if it's a bit more tricky, you're going to have lists and lists and lists. Um, but like in R, there are, there are already kind of a family of functions that help us do a lot of this stuff. So if I just want the mean 
of all the columns in Mount Cars, um, put in Mount Cars, which is the data frame, tell it to give me the mean, and then I let it know that I want to remove any NAs to calculate it. And then it does output the, the mean value. Um, this kind of syntax, I actually, I don't think it's even that bad at all. And um, I'll apply, like, it's much better than writing this stuff. Um, but let's say there's more things you can do. You can get like the median value. You just change the name of the function because L apply is one of those like higher order functions that it takes a function. Um, I guess it's a function as well. Like it takes a function as an argument and does stuff with it. Um, you can do anonymous functions inside L applies, which is you'll notice the main difference is like, okay, now I can get both out at the same time. So I feed in a list of functions here. Um, and for each each variable, will I get the variable name, the mean and the median. And because it's an anonymous function, you'll notice that this stuff, na.rm equals true, is inside the mean function call, as is the x. So it's saying like all the stuff in mount cars is x, and then for each x, do this stuff. Whereas before, when you're not using an anonymous function, you'd have this kind of syntax. It's like lets you put in an arbitrary number of arguments here after the function. Um, but you have to know that that bit is being applied in here and that this bit is being applied over there. This, this kind of syntax is normally more intuitive for people and more flexible. Um, you can use other things too, right? Like the any word, which with any verb that just says, is there anything in this list or this vector that I'm doing that uh, satisfies this condition. And the condition I'm looking for is, well, is there any NAs? And you see like, it's all false. So that says that there are no NAs in any of the map class columns. And um, yeah, so we will get on to the better way to do this, but like another key reason apart from functions and iterations or I guess it's linked to iterations because you're always working with lists but it's like um dealing with lists now personally I find whenever I find a data structure like this this kind of makes me squirm um like it's not nice to start trying to figure out or well, how do you how do you interact with all this stuff like if I just want to know which hobbies are outdoors and stuff and like you could have outdoor equals list, and then you could have like likes, dislikes. You could have, you could, have, they could, the nest, the list can be so, so deep um, that you start having to write, like, say, if you want to get the, um, let's get the first item right out of the outdoor hobbies list. Um, you have to type first. You could use the dollar sign, but I guess when you're iterating, say, with like L apply, you're, more likely to use this kind of syntax but you go first and look in user profile hobbies um so you're in here then you say okay look in outdoor so then you're in here and then you say give me number one so you're in here on running um and then if you want number two well you just change this little bit of code but let's say there were like there were lots of different items here and you need to do something to all of them or you wouldn't you wouldn't want to type out all the different user profile hobbies outdoors and the numbers and all the different variables that there might be so you could if you didn't like l apply or per you could write a for loop and i would never recommend doing this because even when i just went to write this earlier this took me a while to sit bash my head against and I've tried writing this stuff lots of <laughs> lots of times. Um, so like when you get to, you need to do actions on every single one of them and you want to avoid doing this, like, right? So you want to avoid doing all the copying and stuff. It's not really that nice to have the for loops. You could do it with L apply, um, but essentially there's this different package per, and per's job is to help you achieve these kinds of things um and this kind of thing but with like the tidy verse philosophy which is it should be 
easier for you to um, succeed than it should be for you to fail. Um, whereas when you're writing this stuff, believe me, it's much easier to fail <laughs> and it's much, much harder to succeed. Um, but okay, so that's my, that was me thinking about what do I think are the important parts of Per and what's a good primer. But then there was also this document. Now, this document is it's one of the articles. So before in DeepLayer, we were always kind of following reference. So we'd say we'd start here and we would we'd start with the map family. So we'd maybe read this and then we'd go, okay, we'll look in map. We'd have a bunch of the examples. So either examples that we'd written ourselves or examples that we get out of here. And then we'd start reading the arguments and we try to figure out which are the interesting ones, which are not interesting, how do they work, uh, which are new, because one of the big reasons for starting this club was to look at the new versions of Per and the new versions of DeepLayer. Um, so what I would say is we, we could go over this. Um, it kind of does what I started doing, but it does it, I'd say, more thoroughly and definitely better because it shows you like here's what you do in base R, here's what you do in per um shows you like how to how to iterate so if you want to extract stuff so like start using this syntax and um, tells you what a predicate is and the things you use in per that achieve uh different i guess different tasks like keep and discard that are kind of really tricky to get your head around in base R. Um, but I think this wouldn't be a bad starting point next week um, for whoever's presenting to have prepared this. Um, the alternatives, right, are uh, we start in the docs or we go to one of these tutorials. Um, yeah, so there, there are different things in here that are cool. And in this tutorial, I'm pretty sure she references Jenny Bryan's tutorials. Um, but there are a bunch of different things that will help people understand her. Um, like, why do you use the formula? Um, and I, I definitely wouldn't be against starting here. Um, I'll also get the our studio so guys can have a look and i think what we should do is we should discuss where we want to start next week um this one is yeah so it's like it's part four of a series of teaching tidyverse and they kind of introduce um some of the things most people start doing with per like reading many files at once and it says well kind of don't don't bother doing this with per because you've got vroom um, and Vroom actually takes a list of files. And I often like personally to reason or to learn from well, what not to do first, because then it helps inform you on what to do. So they give a few examples of like when not to use per, but then finally they end it with when to use per. So we could, we could work through this um, before we start the official docs. Or the last real option that I see is um, this repo. And as far as I know, the website is still down. Oops. So let's just check this. Um, For me, it was working. I think if you search just on the Google, the name of the this mm. Jenny, and you will get. Yeah, I couldn't. I I don't know. Maybe it's a caching issue. Maybe I just need to go into incognito. Click on this one. Click on first link. Uh, where's this in in Zoom or or in Zoom chat? Oh, no, no. Oh, I mean, what what you got in the first result? Yeah, it was the, uh, the first link that it was showing. He's asking you to click on it. Yeah. Okay. So um, oh, I don't know. Reject all. So I yeah. 
this is still what was happening for me, but I don't know if it's like weirdly cached. You see, like if I click here, it just doesn't do anything. Um, but this could just be a complete me problem rather than uh, a Jenny Bryan problem or a GitHub problem. Um, wait, where did my incognito window go? Let's have a look. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. for me. so I think her website was still loading, but I couldn't load the, her tutorials from it. Um, okay. Now it even seems like her website is not loading. I mean, in any case, we don't we don't need to necessarily go through it, but those were when I was scoping it out. Um, those were the main options I could see. Now, let me just really quickly before we do discuss. I'll go over the kind of what happened. So to get to this sheet, which is how each person signs up, um, you can go into Slack, you can go to the tidyverse docs, you go click the presenter sign up, um, and you get get this. You just write your name in here, and let's say if I put Shah, um, Shah's going to come up here as like the people who have signed up. No, Nobody has to present. It's not the case that we have to take it in turns. Um, but it's really nice when when each person does present um, because I think it gets you closer to the material um, and it helps give other people who know they need to prepare for future weeks, gives them more time to present. So for next week, if there is anybody that wants to sign up, please do sign up. But before we do that, let me stop sharing my screen um, and let's take opinions. So I think I'll shut up and each person kind of say what they'd prefer, but we'll start with, let's say we'll start with Sarah um, and then we'll go Priyanka, Arthur, Shah. So we'll go kind of reverse order to before. So the question is when I would like to present, right? Oh, or... sorry. Um, yeah, that wasn't very clear for me. So yeah. the <laughs> question is next week, irrespective of who's presenting do we want to start with one of those three documents like the tutorials so i think it's rebecca barter's tutorial jenny bryan's or the the r studio um when to use per document or do we want to get straight in to the the like documentation as it sits in the per package um i would prefer a tutorial just to get in a bit easier and to have some examples um yeah that are well explained so yeah that would be my preparation cool so what what do you think Priyanka what would what would you prefer um I mean I'm fine this way as well uh I was saying I think the reverse but it's okay I I'm fine with both the ways uh, but in terms of presenting, I know that uh, I think until until first week of July, I mean, I guess this, so this week you've already taken. So next week, I don't think I'll be able to present, but weeks after that should be fine. Um, although the first topic that seemed like was map. So I'm happy presenting map if we do, you know, maybe. The, so I'm looking at this um, Jenny Bryan's um, website and it's got loads of stuff, lessons and examples, resources and talks. Um, so I am thinking we could we could start with this page on talks. There are this is um, this was meant to be probably a two to four hour hands on workshop, and we could pick up uh, you know like initial discussions from here. So next week we could probably take up those, these you know as many presentations we could cover from this page, and then we could move to the docs after that if if that makes you comfortable, Sarah. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, I mean, I like I like that idea. I like the idea of starting with Jenny Bryan's. And um, what about you, Arthur? What do you think? I think I'm pretty well indifferent uh, about you know starting with um, starting with some kind of primer or some kind of tutorials to kind of um, set the scenes, um, or or to jump in directly into the documentation. That being said, I do wonder if 
or kind of the tutor if we if we were to take the tutorial path like how long how long should we stay on that path because i think as priyanka was kind of pointing out there's there's a lot of material there on the, say for example in jenny bryan's um uh per tutorial there's a lot of material there which is both good and bad right i mean good in the sense that it, it provides of i think lots of really nice clear examples that motivate per but maybe bad in the sense it might take us away from 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 the documentation so um i i don't know but I, I guess in summary i i'm indifferent between the two but i do have maybe a slight reservation about the tutorial path just in terms of how long we would stay with the tutorials before before pivoting to um, to to the docs I'll, I'll stop there yeah cool so I, I think before we pass the shot quickly i think what we could do is we could say we do one week max two of tutorials right irrespective of whether there's like four to eight hours on on each one or however long and the onus is on the person presenting to take the key bits to get us up like up and running show some examples of map and how they work um some of the tilde functions because yeah i think you could do a full course and i sadly i can't access the tutorial right right now but i remember going through it before like there i do remember there's a lot of content um but we could we could agree a limit but what do you think shah what would you like to what would you like to do um now, my opinion will be a bit different than all of you. I think we can combine both. We can combine both like, for example, if Jenny uses first argument or second argument in his examples, that is exactly, that should be in the docs as well. So instead of presenting with some RMD file, we can say this function acts as this, which is given in the tutorial. So it's it's just a valid okay. point, but I think um from uh, from the fact that you know the two resources are different, um you know depending on everyone's um comfort with the per at this starting point, uh, we may not know you know at the offset as to you know which example or which tutorial would map to map well with which section of the uh, documentation, I think, may be a little tough one for for everyone to be able to do in the same, um, you know, with, with that same comfort level. So, um, it, it might things might start making sense eventually. I think, but um, you know, being able to do both uh, may not be easy for everyone. I think that's in the simplest terms I'm saying. And um, if, if I were to give some feedback, so while I was looking at this talks page um so i see that the first one and the fourth one seems uh more useful than others because the second and third one so there are four talks uh presentations that i see here uh, so one and four are more hands-on second and third are more like you know using examples on and you know thinking about legos and probably getting you into the mindset um, so I would suggest whoever wants to take this up could probably go through two and three, but I don't think there is too much to, um, I, I guess if, if I were to do this, I would say probably take up stuff from the first presentation and the fourth presentation and talk about it. And, and, you know, obviously there will be common things. So just, uh, call out things that you think are important, what you learn from one, and then, you know, you take only additional incremental things from the other slides. But one and four are more on the actual implementation point of view, and two and three seem like logic-based. So you could read through two and three, and then use the, you know, maybe just, just as it is, use the slides from uh, presentation one, and then say, okay, you know, presentation four has these two more additional things that I would like to discuss, something like that. So we don't have to, you know, like we discussed earlier, we don't have to necessarily make any presentations. But if you think, you know, slide two and three, they gave you a good sense, and you know, you picked up two points out of those that you would want to share, then then maybe have it written in RMD or maybe you know your handwritten notebook or and or anywhere else you feel comfortable, and then talk about it. Then, when you're bringing things up, yeah. So, so the recommendation would be if we're doing the tutorials to to work on, and I can't see the tutorials at the moment, so I'm having to just imagine. But number one and four would make sense for um, 
the first tutorials like as a primer and we leave two and three for people's own reading yeah and and so all of these uh, no these are not tutorials i think these what i'm talking about primarily is uh, this section on talks on in the per tutorial website um so the third section on talks this has four slides from Jenny Bryan. She must have presented at different times. Um, so out of these four talks, yeah, one and four seem more, you know, they have more examples like our code examples, which we can relate to. And then second and third have more examples like from the understanding point of view where it shows, okay, this is Lego piece, you know, these colored Lego pieces, um, how you want to match and how you want to, you know, make things similar and, and things like that yeah well so i guess the next question is does anybody want to um volunteer to present next week because what we've kind of always done is we've allowed the person who's going to present to decide what they present so if anyone feels very comfortable with per in general and wants to like do the tutorial or wants to dive into the docs i mean it's kind of on the person who who steps up to present if it's left to me i think i will try to go through the jenny Bryan tutorial and make a one hour summary of everything that i see that looks most pertinent or important to get off the ground with per but that's that's if i'm left to do it so if anybody else wants to do it, and I mean, I'm really happy for someone else to do it. So please don't think to, that you're like taking it away from me or anything. If anybody has a different idea or thinks they can see that that's not the best use of our time, well, now's a, now's a really good time to, to say. Uh, we would like you to present because you presented this idea of Jenny Bryan and you know, I mean, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I mean, the, the one big issue I foresee is if I can't make the, the website load. Um, and I don't know why I can't. It's really weird that it's not even loading in incognito. But I mean, I, I can actually just get the stuff from the repo rather than the website. But okay, so the deal is then, uh, and we can reassess next week if we feel like we've done the full hour and we still need or would like more like of a landing, a gentle landing into the package, well, we'll reassess. But for next week, I will do a speed run of Jenny Bryan's talks. Um, okay. I mean, at this stage, I think something we did, sorry, forget to do is like the introductions. So I think we should do them because... Sarah, especially you weren't here in the last one. Um, but I'm Jack. Oh, I'm going to put my camera on now because I'm not going to be moving around too much. So I'm Jack. I'll be the facilitator, as you probably guessed. Um, I'm a data scientist. I work mainly with text data. Um, I program nearly exclusively in R nowadays. I originally learned Python. Um, but I do do some stuff, some stuff in Python. Um, Done a few book clubs like the Shiny Book Club, um, you know, Standing Your Eyes of Shiny, the Deep Liar, um, most of a DevOps book club, and just quite enjoy the the learning together with other people rather than just having my head in the books. And um, but yeah, nice to meet you. Um, who wants to go next? I don't want to have to assign people, so if we could all introduce ourselves, that'd be good. I can go next. So I'm Sarah. Um, and I'm a master's student in econ going towards a PhD in econ. And I almost exclusively code with R. Um, so I use it for my research. Um, so mostly regressions and then the whole data wrangling before that. Um, yeah, and I've not really used PER before. So I'm really excited to um yeah get to know more about this with you guys okay so thank you sarah um i am actually in phd so uh, and i use r and python as well for my data wrangling and making making graphs 
what what Jack was telling about the for loops, I am stuck in that. So, so right now using lots of for loops. So if I can uh, use per, I think I can get rid of my for loops. Okay, I can go next. Um, I'm Priyanka. Um, I currently work as a, a senior consultant at Procogia. Uh, I've been working with R, programming with R exclusively for many years now. Um, uh, I, I have been a, a freelancer a while ago and sometimes on the side too. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I have used for I guess I would say a little bit because I'm sure there is so much uh, of a you know treasure to to figure out. But uh, I am actually interested in 